for occasion, the seminar. Okay, so Heinz, how are you doing? Fine, fine. I'm very glad to be here and see very, very good uh, friends, old friends, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> All young friends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see, yes, okay. Okay, well, thank you very much for, for being with us today. I, I don't know, uh, Helios, if, if, if we have to uh, wait for some more people to arrive or shall we start now? That's it. I think that's okay. We are all here, I think so. So we can start. I will, how can I say, pass the word to the Inas to introduce the Heinz. Uh, so please. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So uh, good good evening uh, in Europe. Good morning uh, in good morning in Mexico. Uh, I don't know, perhaps good evening also in the United States, in Massachusetts, Mohan. It's um, just past one o'clock, yes. Okay, all right. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for being uh, here today for this uh, very important conference uh, by Professor Heinz Kuz, uh, who will be uh, uh, speaking about uh, Max Beva on the spirit of capitalism economic development and uh, growth. So uh, I, I want to thank, thank uh, Heinz for accepting to uh, contribute to be a part of this celebration of uh, both uh, uh, Anthony III was a contribution, wonderful contributions to uh, economic uh, theory uh, and also uh, the celebration of the 80th anniversary of uh, our journal, uh, Investigación Económica, the main economic journal of the National University uh, of Mexico. So this is a very important uh, occasion. And uh, thank you uh, again. So uh, let me briefly uh, comment on uh, the CV of uh, Professor Heinz Cruz, uh, which is very extensive. Uh, so I, I, I won't uh, mention uh, uh, everything, of course, but if you want to know more about uh, Professor High School, you can always visit his uh, web page where you will find, uh, I mean, all kinds of information and of course, uh, uh, all of his publications. So I will simply highlight some uh, particular issues. So Professor High School, uh, received his PhD in economics from uh, uh, Kiel University uh, back in 1977, 1978. See, he was a visiting fellow of Wilson College in, in Cambridge, uh, UK. He was appointed to a chair in economics at the University of Bremen in 1979, and then at the University of Graz, Austria in 1988. Professor Heinz Kurz served as a Theodore Hughes Professor of Economics uh, in 1990, 1991 at the New School for Social Research at the Graduate Faculty of the New School for Social Research. Actually, that was the occasion when uh, Heinz and, 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 and uh, I met Heinz for the first time, and it was really a wonderful event to have met him uh, in New York. Professor High School has also uh, uh, held uh, numerous visiting professorships around the world. I mean, in many, many countries. And of course, he's been to Mexico, he's been to uh, Yunnan uh, in, the, in 1995. So I presume if I'm not uh, wrong, uh, Heinz will right. correct me. He came to Yunnan uh, to give a wonderful seminar uh, based on his recently published book, the theory of production, he was, which was published in 1995 uh, by uh, Cambridge University Pref, Press. The main, uh, Heinz's main fields of research are the theory of production, capital theory, income distribution, technical change and innovation, economic growth, and the history of economic analysis. Professor Kuz has received several prizes and awards. He was also the president of the European Society for the History of Economic Thought. And now he is the managing editor of the journal Metra Economica, and he serves on the boards of several 
uh, economic journals. In particular, he is a member of the editorial board of Investigación Económica. And for that also, I, I, I think, I thank Anna, I mean, uh, Heinz Paul for helping us in the editorship of uh, Investigación Económica. Heinz Kurz is the general editor of Pierre Rafa's works and correspondence on behalf of Cambridge University Press. So I think that, uh, I mean, with this resume, I mean, this is very, very uh, short uh, resume. Uh, uh, we now know who Heinz Kurz is. I mean, he's a very important uh, author in economics. And I would like to ask Heinz uh, 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 <clears throat> to uh, give us his presentation. So the floor is yours, Heinz, and thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much indeed. Um... Uh, Ignacio, it's, it's a great pleasure to be with you today, and uh, this is first an opportunity to congratulate a number of people. First, of course, Tony Thurwell. He deserves credit for his path-breaking contributions to development economics. In addition, we owe him important works in regional economics, the analysis of unemployment and inflation, and the balance of payments theory. His textbook, Economics and Development, Theory and Evidence, is a bestseller and, if I'm not mistaken, is currently in its ninth edition. The famous law in development economics is named after him, Thurwell's, Thurwell's Law. He is also the biographer and literary executor of Nicholas Caldo, who was a close collaborator of John Maynard Keynes and befriended with celebrity John von Neumann. This year saw Tony Thurwell's 80th birthday. Congratulations, Tony, and all the best. Can you see I have a glass of uh, champagne here. I don't know what you are drinking in, in impoverished Britain, <laughs> but uh, anyway, all the best. Well, now your mic is closed. Uh, yes, no. This is brandy. <laughs> <laughs> There is another birthday to be celebrated this year. Um, Ignacio has already mentioned that. And this brings me to Jesus Silva Herzog, who was initiative in founding a scientific economic journal in Latin America, which then became Investigación Económica, established in 1941, and like Tony, celebrates its 80th birthday. So also, salute <laughs> to the journal. You see, I have. Thank you. I have. I have uh, given me some arguments in favor of <laughs> having some champagne. Now, Herzog, a few words about him. He was born in, in 1892 and passed away in 1985. He was a distinguished Mexican economist. He was involved in the nationalization of the oil industry in 1938 a main advocate of the import substitution strategy, an outstanding professor at UNAM, during the Mexican Revolution imprisoned, but eventually set free, and the author of many influential books and articles, best known perhaps his book on the Mexican Revolution. In this context, UNAM must be mentioned and praised for having published Investigación Económica during such a long period of time. The limited resources available to the journal were admirably compensated by the choice of several of its editors who mustered an enormous amount of energy, goodwill and intellectual and organizational prowess and succeeded in making the Investigación Económica a leading journal in Latin America and beyond. This is a remarkable achievement again. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Um, now, one of the editors is Ignacio Perrottini, whom I consider a close friend, and who in 1995, as he mentioned, invited uh, Neri Salvadori and me to give a course in the PhD program. Mentioning our stay in Mexico brings back sweet memories of a fabulous hospitality, excellent discussions, the visit of marvelous cultural and scenic places, and last but not least, 
an earthquake of magnitude 7.4 at the Richter scale, a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico we had to go through, and a siege of San Cristobal de las Casas because of the fear that a huge manifestation of indigenous people might get out of control. It was the time of Subcomandante Marcos, as you might remember. Now, of course, all these events helped to strengthen our friendship and uh, be friends ever since. So congratulations and ad multos annos to all those who are still with us. Now, what I'm going to uh, talk today, and this is not exactly Tony's theme. Um, it's not Keynesian inspired, Caldo inspired, uh, but I think he plays an important role in the history of uh, our societies. And this is Max Weber on the spirit of capitalism, as he called it, economic development and growth. Now, the contents of my talk will be the following. After a short introduction, I will briefly speak about the life and work of Weber, then some prolegomena to the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism is presumably most uh, best well-known uh, piece of literature. Then the historical power of ideas, because that is an important topic in his work. Weber's explanation in the light of recent economic theory, some reactions to Weber's work then and now, and then some remarks on, on Weber and Marx, because we can show that he was highly influenced by Karl Marx, then some concluding observations. Now, the first question we might ask, was Weber an economist at all? <laughs> and clearly, uh, oh, now this is gone, why is that? Uh, was Weber an economist at all? And the answer is, of course, yes, he was. Uh, maybe not, uh, if measured, uh, in terms of our discipline nowadays, but economics is what economists do at a given time and place. And at the time when Weber wrote, he was clearly to be considered an economist and got chairs at, at the major universities um, in, in Germany. And even Schumpeter, who doubted that he was an economist, called him the head of the youngest historical school now. His, the historical school, of course, belonged to economics at the time. Um, he was also a homo universalis in the social sciences and beyond, an extremely educated man, well-educated man, erudite, and uh, knowledgeable in many areas. He devoted his entire work um, to uh, several subjects about which we will uh, speak more closely. And he was uh, keen to objective ruthlessness, what he called objective ruthlessness. I mean, to try, try to be as precise and clear as possible. Now, briefly about his work, uh, his life, sorry, and work. Born in 1864 in Erfurt in Germany, father, lawyer, a member of the Reichstag, uh, a liberal uh, member of uh, uh, the political party spectrum. Now, Weber had health problems throughout his life. He had a very feeble health. In 89, he studied uh, in Berlin and then, uh, first in Heidelberg, and then in Berlin, he got his PhD at the Friedrich Wilhelms Universität on the history of trading companies in the Middle Ages. 1892, habilitation in legal history and venia legendi in Roman law and German commercial law in 1893, he became associate professor in Berlin and married. Marianne Schnittke, who became a famous um, uh, feminist in, in, in Germany at the time. In 92, he participated in an important inquiry of the Verein für Sozialpolitik, that is the, so to speak, German Economic Association, on the situation of agricultural workers in East Elbia and the Polish question. I won't enter into it, it's, a, it's an interesting theme, but it uh, goes beyond uh, the confines of my talk. 94, appointed to a chair in economics and finance at the University of Freiburg in southern Germany, and read, interestingly, 
gave lectures on general economics. This is economic theory, practical economics. This is economic policy and public economics, that is public finance. Now, interestingly enough, he said that uh, he now was going to hear the lectures for the first time, namely by himself. <laughs> he had never attended that stuff uh, in universities. His economic teaching was, was, was not very uh, uh, enormous. In 97, he became the successor of Karl Knies on one of the most important uh, chairs in Germany, the University of Heidelberg. And that is also the time when his work on the Protestant ethic and uh, um, uh, the spirit of capitalism began. He suffered from an increasing inability to speak and panic attacks, and he had to give up teaching. Leave of absence in 1898 and left his post completely in 1903. For the next 15 years, he was a private scholar living off the interest income from his and his wife's inheritances. He spent much time in Rome at the Royal Prussian Historical Institute, where he studied economic history, social history, and especially the history of monasticism. In 1902, his friend and rival, Sombart, published the Moderne Kapitalismus. He was actually the man who introduced the concept of capitalism into economics um, uh, apart, uh, above and beyond Marx. Now, uh, Weber was, was pretty active at the time and uh, published a number of, of articles, one on objectivity in the social sciences. I, I'll come back to that in a minute. He became the editor of the Archiv für Sozialwissenschaft und Sozialpolitik, that is a major economic journal in Germany at the time. And in 1904 also saw the first part published of his Protestant ethic. He traveled to the United States to study Protestant sects there. In 1905, we see the second part published of his uh, important uh, treatise. In 1909, on the, uh, uh, at a meeting of the Verein für Sozialpolitik in Vienna, there was a confrontation with Gustav Schmoller, the head of the historical school, and Weber attacked him fiercely because he felt that, uh, I mean, mixing in uh, political and uh, ideological uh, uh, items into uh, scientific teaching was false and should be avoided. He played for the freedom of value judgment, a famous, a famous debate, which uh, was not only uh, fought in, in, in Germany, but also elsewhere. Frustrated by the Verein für Sozialpolitik, he founded the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Soziologie. And it is ironical that the Sociological Society was founded because he wanted economics to get out of the stuffy, the sticky room of economics, which was all uh, mixed up. I mean, science, uh, um, political judgments, ideology, and so on and so forth. And he eventually left uh, uh, the Sociological Society. In 1909, he started a work on uh, Grundriss der Sozialökonomik, an outline of the social economics, many volumes. And a part of it was his economic and economics and society, a vol voluminous work trying to incorporate all the uh, accumulated knowledge um, he thought was important. But he couldn't see its publication. It came out uh, edited by his wife in 1922. In 1914, Weber, as many other intellectuals, was a war enthusiast. Uh, I mean, he was very much uh, uh, in favor of that war, but he very quickly saw that the whole thing was terrible. I mean, the costs it, uh, it had in terms of bloodshed and uh, destruction was enormous. And uh, he quickly began to publish uh, articles in German newspapers asking for a peace treaty and also for an increase of uh, the power of parliament and democracy in Germany. His income situation, because of the war, but also because of uh, extramarital affairs, became problematic. 
And so he was on the lookout for a teaching post again. The University of Vienna wanted to get him and offered him a chair in 1918, which he didn't take. He became a member of the German delegation at the peace negotiations in Versailles, where he could have met Keynes. I'm not aware of any document that uh, uh, indicates that he in fact did. I wonder whether Tony knows anything about this. As far as I know, they didn't meet and both uh, were very frustrated because their expertise was not in demand uh, by their uh, delegations. Uh, in 1919, as he assumed the professorship at the University of Munich and lectured on an outline of a universal social and economic history in which he again took up the big uh, theme, namely capitalism, its uh, uh, beginnings, uh, its uh, structure, its uh, content, and its uh, a change as time went by. He published several essays on, on the ethics of world religions and systems of regulating life, but he couldn't finish his work in this regard because in, in 1920, on the 14th of June, he died from pneumonia, pneumonia in Munich. It was the Spanish flu, but it, his, his death was not related to it. So that is his life. Now, Prolegomena to the Protestant ethic and trying to give you an impression of what he was working on. I mean, let's go through a number of items. Freedom from value judgments. Uh, Weber was convinced that different value systems are in inextricable struggle with each other. And since the elimination of the magic from this world, and the elimination, basically, of the old gods and demons, at least, I mean, the tremendously reduced power for everyday life, that was a good thing. But at the same time, there were new demons and gods emerging, which are no less frightening. The capturing of the mind of people was uh, what um, fascinated him a lot. And if you look at the United States and the impact Trump had, on people there, you can get an impression of the power of ideas. And if, I mean, you can indeed uh, capture people's minds, what that means. Now, in the meeting of the Financial Sozialpolitik 1909 in Vienna, the, the main theme was on productivity in economics. And this Weber took, so to speak, as, a, uh, as an occasion to assault the historical school because he argued fuzzy concepts invite political abuse. And these people fell, were, were, were victims to the naturalistic fallacy, that is to say, describing a particular situation to historicists and thinking that from this you can derive immediately uh, what ought to be, from the being to ought to be, what should be, is a fallacy. It's wrong uh, and should not be allowed in academia, you may have your political opinion, but you should uh, utter it and fight for it outside the lecture hall. You should not rally students behind you as, a, as an ideologue, so to speak, who is, uh, 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 I mean, uh, advocating a particular ideology. At the same time, Weber was very clear that economics is confronted with such a complex uh, topic that, uh, Pluralism in economics was unavoidable. And when Schmoller attacked Smithians and Marxians as not belonging to the discipline because uh, they were utterly wrong and didn't understand what was going on, he attacked him fiercely arguing, no, come on, we are standing on the shoulders of these guys. What we know today is to a large extent what they put forward. And therefore, uh, this is important uh, to keep these people um, so to speak, uh, in intellectual life and to allow in universities uh, a heterogeneity of opinions. Also, if you, if you are uh, thinking that, I mean, what matters should only be facts, well, I mean, uh, the sea of facts is infinite and silent. So, I mean, which facts and what are the openers, so to speak, in order to understand facts in terms of theory? You need several of them. They should compete, and you must not uh, single out some um, at the detriment of others. 
Now, I was very critical of uh, concepts of averages and aggregate concepts like productivity, as already mentioned, but also general welfare or common interest. Uh, these were just concepts which were misleading and could be abused. He took, in fact, a radically microsociological position. We had to go down uh, to the deep levels. Uh, you had to look at people and their decisions, but all of the meanings people attributed to their decisions. And as regards uh, the issue of objectivity in the social sciences, what Weber thought uh, the social sciences should bring about is a thinking order of empirical reality, which focuses on meaning, meaning also attributed to the, to the reality by people, because that shapes their behavior, their actions, and has an impact on the actual world. But there is no such thing as a purely objective scientific analysis. You may have bits and pieces which contribute to a better understanding what there is, but to think that you find the law which regulates the world is just ridiculous. And therefore, he was very critical of economics, which he accused of having fallen victim to a naturalistic monism. Of course, given the success of the sciences, the natural sciences in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, with major scientists uh, playing an important role, other sciences tried to imitate them and economics was one of them. I mean, trying to be a sort of, of physics, but um, this was, I think, just misleading. This obsession with economic laws was a misleading uh, uh, enterprise. And in particular, the deductibility of reality of the laws one thought one had found was highly problematic. Uh, Weber was opposed to it, and therefore he was also opposed basically to model building in the, in the way we know it today. He was in favor of building ideal types, meaning the enhancement of one or several points of view and the amalgamation of many individual phenomena to a, to a synth synthetic concept, uh, whereas economic models, uh, uh, more uh, narrowly speaking, they just produ produced utopias and seldomly really brought you uh, uh, reliable information upon the world as it really was. Now, we lived, he pointed out, in a world in which there were no longer gods and prophets. That is, whilst the Greeks still thought that you could put forward concepts that allowed you to understand uh, the importance of gods and how they ruled the world, and while uh, technical means developed uh, at the time of the Renaissance, and in particular experimentation, which allowed you to control, so to speak, your experience, uh, was seen as providing you uh, an avenue towards a, a deeper understanding of God, uh, this turned out to be an illusion. I mean, many of the scientists uh, in the 16th, 17th century thought that their contributions were indeed contributions to a better understanding of uh, God's plans and so on and so forth. Think of Gossen, the marginal utility theorist, who argued that God was a mathematician, and therefore you had to introduce mathematics to understand the world, and eventually you could, so to speak, reproduce the world as God has created it. And uh, this is, uh, is just rubbish, according to Weber. It turned out to be rubbish. That was the trend. The rationalization, the intellectualization of life, turned out that eventually it was understood, God is hidden, we do not know him, we do not understand his thinking, we cannot really uh, grasp uh, what he is after, it's a, it's a God far away, and we have to find our way, even in science, without him. Now, Weber also had interesting things to say about marginal utility theory and irrational behavior, he was in favor of what he called Verstehen der Soziologie, that is, understanding sociology. And by this, he meant that very often we see people who behave in a particular way, and we are inclined to see if, if, if it doesn't fit rationalism as we understand it, this is irrational. And he said, no, maybe it is not. Maybe they just operate with regard to um, uh, 
side constraints we do not see, we do not understand the meaning they attach to their behavior. And it is very important to see, to see and, uh, and, and find out that meaning. And as a matter of fact, if you compare some of Weber's statements with behavioral economics today, you will find out that they are very similar in some respects. In particular, man and woman, they are multiple self. They are typically uh, subject to various constraints. They play different uh, social roles, and these roles cannot easily be aggregated as regards the preferences uh, which play a role in each one of them. You could say you have an error impossibility uh, theorem there with regard to the individual and, and the social roles it performs. And he also pointed out that there is no symmetry between human nature and technology. If you look today at textbooks where you have indifference curves and isochrons, it's, it looks all as if it is just one um, a copy of the other one. And he argued, no, no, that is, that is not true. Also, pain is not negative pleasure. Uh, today, modern um, uh, uh, investigations in the neurosciences, I mean, uh, say that um, uh, there is some truth in what Weber said, we could uh, put it that way. And he also uh, argued that psychology has no role to play in all this. Uh, it's pragmatism that plays a role, that is, the argument is about means and ends. And as regards marginal utility theory and marginal productivity theory, he was very critical of Martian productivity theory for the reasons I already gave you. Productivity is, is a wishy-washy, fuzzy concept, which must not be used. And he in particular argued that um, income distribution is not determined by uh, uh, scarcity or factors of production that may play a role to some extent, perhaps. Uh, and of course, with regard to land and so on, it certainly does. But what plays a more important role is power and domination. And the fact that power walks on silent feet, so to speak, is hardly visible, does not mean it is not there. Power, he argued, is, so to speak, absorbed into institutions and rules. And a most important aspect of power is the capture of people's minds. You need not be rich, but if you manage that people follow you because they believe in what you're saying, however stupid that may be, uh, <laughs> stolen, stolen elections and so on and so forth. That is good enough. It is good enough. You can fool people for a long time. Now, let's come to the main theme, um, the historical power of ideas. Now, first of all, let us be clear what Weber intended to do in Protestant ethic and the spread of capitalism. He did not wish to be, and quite explicitly, he did not wish to explain capitalism since its beginnings. That is not his intention. He also did not want to substitute a spiritualistic, idealistic interpretation of history for a materialistic one, certainly not. He was exclusively concerned and quite obviously with the roots of what he called modern capitalism in Western Europe and the United States in particular. And he chastised the foolish and doctrinaire thesis that capitalism is a product of the Reformation. It is not. It existed before it. It will exist after it. But the Reformation was a crucial period in the history of capitalism. The differentia specifica is what interest, interested him of modern capitalism. And that was the spirit of capitalism seen as a part of the development of rationalization as a whole. Now, what is the spirit of capitalism? He put it that way. Man is dominated by the making of money, by acquisition as the ultimate purpose of his life. Economic acquisition is no longer subordinated to man as the means for the satisfaction of his material needs. The dominance of making money, right? And of course, this implied a reversal of what we should call the natural relationship so irrational from a naive point of view. This is what he tried to explain. How was it possible that 
this period of capitalism prevailed uh, at the time of the Protestant Revolution. Now, clearly, what we are confronted with here is a problem of opinion dynamics. And Weber is quite cl clear about it. Why did the new, as he called it, infinitely burdensome and earnestly enforced, oh, conduct of life succeed in shaping an occidental culture. It has to, has to be explained. People trying to make money, not caring that much about pleasure, utility, and whatnot. How could the tyranny of Puritanism, as he called it, prevail and establish an unalterable order of things? We could say a bubble with a hard shell. And indeed, what Weber talks about is hurt behavior and contagion. We are today a bit inclined to think that hurt behavior and cont contagion is limited to financial markets and the like. No, no, no. Uh, according to Weber, that is something that can be found almost everywhere in, in human life. Hurt behavior and cont contagion and puritanism was, as I put it, a bubble with the hard shell. So what really needs explanation was the emergen emergence of a way of looking at things as a mass phenomenon. There's also the, the question of power in the religious wars, and he talks about it, but this is an aside, and I won't enter into it. Now, there are two sub-problems to this first. Which of the competing religious ideas at the time of the Reformation, Lutherism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, succeeded, and why? And what was their practical influence on the conduct of life? Because that shaped, so to speak, the economic world thereafter. And clearly enough, we are confronted with what the Austrians called, and Weber had studied the Austrian economists, a problem of imputation. I mean, which cause was re responsible for which effect? And again, what Weber argued was, we can only provide sufficient conditions that allow us to believe that what we explain is, 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 a, is a satisfactory explanation until better ones are available, but there is no economic law that can be elaborated in order to understand the period under consideration. Now, the bearers of ascetic Protestantism were Calvinism, Pietism, Methodism, and Baptism, the four principal forms of ascetic Protestantism. And there was also, of course, the Calvinist predestination doctrine, which played a very important role in, in, in uh, larger parts of uh, the European world at the time, Holland in particular, but also Switzerland and, and other places. And the interesting thing here is that, uh, you see, Catholicism was uh, in decline. And it was, of course, a decline also of the power and uh, the control by the Pope. But what Weber found very, very uh, uh, interesting and intriguing was that even, even stronger powers came in play. And therefore, there was on the one hand, because of the need to interpret the Bible yourself, a tendency towards individualism. But at the same time, this individualism became under the, under the uh, pressure of, 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 of tremendous uh, religious uh, uh, impulses. And actually uh, what resulted was an iron cage under which people lived in many places. Now, with the end of Catholic ecclesiastical domination, the Protestant uh, Christ wanted to know whether in the hereafter, he may sit at the Lord's table or be subject to internal damnation. That was a, a major question. And if you look at paintings at the time, literature at the time, you can see uh, this uh, enormous power uh, that was sitting, so to speak, on the shoulders of people and even on their heads. Uh, and can he, she escape damnation through their deeds in this world? This was uh, of, of great importance to them. And of course, the question was eventually boiled down to how can you prove that you are faithful and that you are in all probability 
subject to God's grace. Now, uh, there was not much he could do because God was far away. There was no clear uh, uh, idea what finally showed uh, that you were, were one of the holy ones and not one of the damned ones. And therefore, I mean, the question was, were they, there, so to speak, roundabouts and professional work eventually, as Luther already pointed out, um, could do that because professional work, I mean, uh, did uh, not allow you to spend your time in, in uh, luxurious uh, enterprises, but focused on just uh, doing your job. And professional work had a single goal in the end, increase of glo God's glo glory on earth. That was the main task of work. Do not squander the fruits of labor or of entrepreneurial activity. They all had to be um, uh, carried out in order to increase God's glory on earth. So ascetic action, the doctrine shifted now from monasteries to the world. Every Christian had to be, as Weber pointed out, a monk all his life. And a monk all his life working hard and not, I mean, squandering the riches implied, of course, you had to, as regards the surplus product you produced, you had to save and invest it. It was, so to speak, saving and investing that showed that you were a good Christian and that God's grace was with you. So work was reinterpreted as a vocation or calling. And there was also a reinterpretation of poverty, misery, and unemployment. I mean, poverty was a sign that there was no grace of God's upon your shoulders. And also, I mean, misery, uh, you couldn't help it. I mean, God had decided that you were a lost creature. And unemployment was, of course, something uh, that also indicated that uh, you were not uh, such a good guy. It is interesting in, in, in empirical studies when people were asked whether they suffer from unemployment, it turned out uh, in recent times that Protestants today suffer more than Catholics. They suffer more from unemployment than Catholics and maybe one of the reasons for that is what has been said here. And also avoid the castaway. Don't mix with those who are uh, not, not in, in, in good shape. Of course, there were other traditions in Protestantism. I'm not saying, nor is, nor is Weber, uh, that this is the only, uh, the only perspective we can find, but that was a dominant one in certain parts. And there was one problem left, and of course, that was the old apostolic hymn of praise for those who have no possessions. And there the argument was, no, it, it does not make sense to, to be poor, as it makes no sense to wish to be sick and God had an idea when he allowed people to make profits and to get rich. Uh, the question is what to do with the riches and clearly enough, don't squander them, save and invest. So that was, so to speak, the, the doctrine which uh, uh, was developed at the time. And um, uh, sorry, at the time and um, let me just uh, uh, tell you a little story. When uh, Protestantism then finally, finally lost its religious roots, when Protestant societies became richer and richer, there was an inclination, of course, to, to consume some of the riches. And a Faustian, that is Marx now, conflict between consumption and accumulation arose. And uh, uh, the dying of the religious roots showed its effects. Now, interestingly, one of the important inspirers of uh, um, uh, Weber was William Petty. William Petty is known as uh, one of the founders of political economy. He wrote in the 17th century uh, after his death, uh, um, his book, uh, Political Arithmetic, uh, was published in 1890, which is one of the first studies on political economy and statistics. And he wrote about the Hollanders, dissenters of this kind, that is Calvinists and Baptists are for the most part 
thinking, sober and patient men and such as believe that labor and industry is their duty towards God. That's the point, it's their duty towards God. However, so how erroneous soever their opinions be, as Petty added, and Weber uh, agreed with him, uh, Protestant, uh, the Puritanism, particularly Calvinism, is a gloomy doctrine. Now let us let us try to understand Weber's argument uh, in the light of recent economic theory with the help of some some recent economic concepts. First, consumption and saving. Modern macroeconomic consumption uh, deals with consumption as the only end of economic activity. You produce because you want to consume now or at a distant period. So your utility function typically is you depends only on C, maybe with the time structure. Now Weber did not activate such a view, nor did Adam Smith, David Ricardo, Marx, Keynes, or any of the other great theorists, by the way. But Weber referred to addictive behavior for the period under consideration, Protestantism. He wrote capital accumulation through ascetic compulsion to save. And he wrote about excessive capital accumulation addiction. The term word is sucht, it's indeed addiction. It's not hedonism, you see. I mean, these people had to save because it was, so to speak, a requirement of their religious beliefs. They, they uh, adopted a crematist lifestyle. Crematism, of course, is the concept of the old Greeks, Aristotle, and so on and so forth. And uh, um, uh, this is uh, what plays an important role. Now, this means that uh, in Weber, basically, if we want to translate it into uh, our economic language, uh, model language, utility does not only depend on consumption, but also on V dot V dot, meaning the change of the capital stock or rather wealth, the assets uh, the person uh, uh, has. And of course, um, you have to invest and save whatever is a surplus above and beyond what is absolutely necessary to satisfy your elementary consumption. The Puritan will eventually Weber wrote, sink into the grave, weighed down with the great material load of money and goods. And clearly enough, if he started with the value of his assets, V sub zero, and it's a time continuous model, R is the rate of interest, T is the time when he dies or she dies, then of course that is the value at which he dies. That is the heritage he leaves. Now, as Weber pointed out, irrationality of this sort of life, where a man exists for the sake of his business is, instead of the reverse, is really amazing. That is the spirit of capitalism, restless hunting. And when you ask people why they do that, eventually they will answer business is what, what its constant work has become, namely in, dis, indispensable to their life. That is, so to speak, the, the ruling. Uh, motivation. Is there a free will? In the early phase, the Puritan wanted to work in a calling, but now we are forced to do so. A mechanism has, so to speak, been installed in our societies that forces us to behave in a particular way. We are born into this mechanism that determines our lives with irresistible force. This is consumption and Saving. Now, what about interest and the growth rate? Now, Weber does not tell us how they are determined. Very often, he has a very complex but open-ended story to tell us. And what I'm giving you is just, I mean, uh, uh, an argument that uh, I think uh, makes it understandable what he was talking. And I will see, I will show you that, I mean, there's a close relationship be between uh, the analysis I put forward and we were saying luxury goods. Now, workers cannot afford them anyway, and the ascetic capitalists absolutely repudiate all idolatry of the flesh, in German creatur vergötterung, as a detraction from the rever reference to God alone. 
the worldly Protestant asceticism acted powerfully against the spontaneous enjoyments of possessions. It constricted consumption, especially of luxuries. Indeed, imagine it's a world without luxury, luxuries in the extreme. It's an exaggeration, but that is what we, what we find here. And this can be, um, so to speak, um, made clear in terms of a simplified von Neumann model with only basic commodities, that is commodities that are indispensable in production, needed each and every one of them in the production of all of them. Assume there's an N-time N indecomposal productive input output matrix A, whose dominant eigenvalue lambda is smaller than unity. In this case, of course, we know, I mean, and you must believe me if you don't know that little piece of uh, analytics, that the rate of interest R and the rate of growth G, in the case in which whatever is a surplus will be saved and invested, are given by G equals R equals lambda, one minus lambda divided lambda. Since lambda is smaller than unity, you see the growth rate is positive. Now, Weber calls capitalists, interestingly enough, acquisition machines. And Kelvin Lancaster, in a comment on the von Neumann model, actually about uh, uh, the inoptimality of economic growth there, called them merely investing machines. There is indeed a, a close co correspondence. Now, the growth rate in Puritan society, that is the argument, is higher because of First, lower propensity consume of capitalists. They are now ascetic people. Secondly, because of an annual labor performed per worker larger at constant real wages, that is smaller real wage rates. I shall come to that. Indeed, at that time in the 17th, 16th, 17th century, many of the holidays were uh, uh, translated back into working days. Uh, the length of the working day was increased and real wages per, per unit of labor per hour per day were not increased. And finally, higher work ethic of both capitalists and workers because of higher labor intensity. So what we find is a smaller lambda and therefore a higher R and G. Is this dynamically inefficient? Well, only if consumption was the sole end of production, which it is not in Weber, of course. He talks about, we can say, essentially extensive growth in the presence of low, actually lower real wages, a harsh professional ethic and a great frugality. It requires an adjustment clearly of the growth in the number of God's creatures. And interestingly enough, Weber had a lot to say about that, uh, but uh, he did not have a theory, so to speak. Now, there is empirical evidence, for example, in a recent paper by Kelly, Ograda, and uh, Mokir, 2020, The Mechanics of the Industrial Revolution. They look at the antechamber of the Industrial Revolution, and they find out, indeed, that uh, um, uh, that was, uh, in fact, so to speak, uh, pushing growth, small, small real wages, large uh, working hours, and frugality. Um, now, a brief picture. This is from Vogel, The History of Mankind at a Glance. We are here down there, discovery of the new world. That is about the situation, uh, not a lot of growth, but in Protestant areas, larger growth than in many other of the areas. So there is a kind of takeoff. Uh, and we also have uh, another picture. This is by Mansfield where you can see the light blue curve, uh, 1700, where Europe was able to increase relative to the rest of the world, its share of uh, national product uh, as a whole. So you can see there are some uh, reflections of what we have been talking about. Now, in Weber, there's very little talk about innovations and technological change, very little. And this is understandable for the period under consideration, but that was not totally absent, of course. There were periods of growth. There were periods of invention and so on and so forth, and some quite important. But 
it was not, so to speak, uh, a new normal yet, which only came in later. We find little of what Schumpeter called the overwhelming fact in the economic history of the capitalist society. But what that tells you already that Schumpeter was right for the latter period, not so much for the earlier one, right? In the earlier one, that was not uh, the crucial thing. Oh God, sorry, um, here. Yeah. What we also do not find in Weber, who also wrote about later periods, a discussion of these items. His uh, microsociological point of view, his abhorrence as regards aggregates and averages, and his dislike of concepts like productivity, uh, apparently did not allow him to talk about these things. I mean, this is, of course, rather ridiculous because modernity since the Industrial Revolution had a lot to do with increases in labor productivity and whatnot. And of course, also, if you want to write the histoire raisonné of modernity, you would also wish, I think, to, uh, I mean, classify phases of economic development in terms of dominant forms of technical progress, but this you don't find. Like other historians or historical school members, he had difficulty in seeing the abstract in the concrete. That was a problem to him. And clearly enough, but that is something uh, he indicates here and there, there is of course a pull effect of economic progress. If in some countries, all of a sudden a takeoff is taking place, others might start to imitate. And clearly enough, ideas are historically significant, but uh, their importance is not locked in locally, they are spillovers. And if you look at the world as a whole, of course, uh, that is uh, a message that is important to make. Now, some reactions to Weber's work, I think I have to be very brief. Until when can I speak? Uh, do I have uh, 10, 15 minutes more, or do you want me to speak? Yes, go Sorry. ahead, go ahead, yes, yes. Yeah? Or are you already completely exhausted and uh, would like to go over to a... <laughs> A glass of tequila as you keep drinking in Mexico. We, we don't, we don't. We, we are already here. having tequila, don't worry. So you can go, you can uh, continue. Okay, good. So some, oh, what was that? Some reactions to Weber's work. Uh, at first, I mean, in Germany, for of course, um, historians, etc. many of them misunderstanding him, uh, not a very interesting debate, I must say. But he became very powerful in the English and uh, American, uh, Anglo-American world. Richard Tawney in 1926 published a book in which he broadened the, uh, the so-called Weber thesis. And then of course the uh, sociologist Halkin Parsons, who had studied in Germany with historicists, um, translated into English, a translation which is not very good, very often misleading according to me, and uh, also Robertson in 1933, questioning the calling issue, etc. I, I won't go into it. Uh, let's uh, immediately go to recent contributions, and there is an avalanche, an avalanche of contributions. Weber, so to speak, is one of the most heatedly debated social scientists in our times. Um, just a few uh, uh, references. Peltonen, uh, gave an overview of uh, uh, statements about P Weber and the Weber thesis as time went by. Young um, wrote about uh, whether the Weber thesis was correct that I mean, Protestant areas um, increased more swiftly income per capita in many countries, which he found as uh, largely confirmed. So did Rubin, who did that with regard to various uh, big cities. Indeed, there was a, an overtaking by Protestant areas and Protestant cities compared to Catholic ones. Becker and Wessmann, in a big article in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, talked about Weber, but they, I mean, strangely enough, I mean, they, um, the, the article is interesting, but strangely enough, they, um, we're talking about Prussia in the late 19th century. And of course, Weber did not consider the Weber thesis as applicable to that late area. And they argued 
that what was important for growth in that period was the fact that Protestants had to read the Bible and having to learn reading, of course, allowed them to enlarge their knowledge of the world. The access to knowledge and information was uh, much easier and therefore there was a human capital formation aspect. Uh, this is not always confirmed, but uh, they argue basically that the Weber thesis ought to be interpreted in that way. Weber didn't do that. Uh, then there were uh, papers by Bai and Kaising Kung and others, uh, for example, asking whether uh, Protestant missionaries in China had an impact. Uh, Barron and McCleary, uh, Kirsting, Woolsey, the Wolf, they point out that nationalist tendencies played a role and so on and so forth. Now, let me just refer to one different perspective on what was going on, at least partly different perspective of what was going on in the 16th, 17th and 18th century, that is the formation of a culture of innovation and growth. And uh, this was essentially um, stimulated, one could say, by the sociologist Merton, who was a student of Parsons, who himself started from Francis Bacon, the natural philosopher who argued that, I mean, mankind can get, can get out of, so to speak, the Malthusian era, era of uh, misery and, 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 and problems. Um, there was the possibility of getting uh, increased incomes per capita, uh, provided, I mean, you, you produced knowledge which was economically useful and improved your techniques improved your organizations and so on and so forth. And uh, Joe and Mocke in a book entitled A Culture of Growth, The Origins of the Modern Economy, these were actually his Graz Schumpeter lectures he gave in Graz in 2000 and I think uh, 13 or 14. He argues this in great detail and he pointed out that, uh, I mean, so to speak, the, uh, the um, growth process started during the Industrial Revolution and maybe even earlier, was eventually due uh, to, um, uh, I mean, a lucky coincidence of institutional reforms in Europe, which together brought about a situation in which all of a sudden, indeed, the production and use of economically useful knowledge became predominant. There was a, a tremendous belief in progress, in bettering people's lives, uh, going beyond the Marshallian point of view. And um, uh, one of the main reasons why this happened was that all these institutional reforms and so on and so forth implied a reduction of access costs to information and knowledge. And therefore, so to speak, uh, a tremendous increase in in combinatoric uh, possibilities. I mean, combining part particles of knowledge in order to create knowledge, new knowledge and so on and so forth, which is, so to speak, at the source of what happened ever since. And uh, clearly enough, the economics of religion, which uh, Weber basically started, um, played an important role in more recent times in our discipline in economics. There were two huge articles in the Journal of Economic Literature uh, on that topic. And so it is back, so to speak, again, in the center of interest in economics uh, after a long time where Weber was considered an outcast. He is no longer looked at that. Now, to conclude, so to speak, uh, uh, let me talk about Ka Max Weber and Karl Marx. I mean, there was one guy, Schumpeter, who saw that there's a close connection. Many people didn't see it and still don't see it, but I think there is. And I will give you four uh, items in which that can be seen very, very clearly. Now, Marx is not mentioned in uh, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. Uh, he should have been mentioned, but there is no need of that because at the time when Weber wrote, everyone could be expected to have read Karl Marx who was in the social sciences, whether he was an economist or a sociologist, um, a historian or whatever. 
And the first thing I would like to point out is Marxist distinction between what he called production of absolutes and of relative surplus value. He defined the surplus value produced by prolongation of the working day. That is Marx. I call absolute surplus value. On the other hand, a surplus value arising from the curtailment of the necessary labor time, that is the labor time needed to reproduce wage goods, right? And from the corresponding alteration in the respective length of the two components of the working day, I call relative surplus value. Now, clearly enough from what we have heard, Weber was essentially concerned with the period of the capitalist development in which the production of absolute surplus value was important. It was not so much, if at all, relative surplus value. So clearly enough, that is uh, a point which must not be uh, overlooked. And Marx also in, in, in Capital and in many other places uh, made a number of statements in this regard. He pointed out, for example, what I already alluded to earlier on, Protestantism, by changing almost all the traditional holidays into workdays, plays an important part in the genesis of capital. That is Marx. So clearly, Weber's concept of absolute surplus value is Marx's, clearly enough. Now, a second thing we could uh, talk about is uh, what about being determines consciousness? I think you're all familiar with that statement. Or more precisely, um, uh, social being determines the thinking of people, as you find it in the German ideology. Now, this is very often interpreted in a very foolish and naive way. Now, clearly enough, to interpret Weber's thesis as a simple reversal of the ca causality, that is, now consciousness determines being would be ridiculous. First of all, because only particulars, not universals, can be related to one another. The Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, not universals. Uh, this was clear to both Weber and Marx because uh, they were schooled in, in philosophy. But more importantly, ideas have consequences. But these, these consequences react back on the ideas, that is, there is a co-evolution, or as Weber put it, of processes of mutual, mutual adaptation and relationships. Indeed, that is the case. You see, I mean, it's not that simple. It's not uh, one directional, for sure not. And Weber, in some of his writings, then pointed out interests, material and idea, not ideas, directly dominate people's actions. But the worldviews created by ideas have very often set the course in which the dynamics of interests move action forward. So there is a complicated translation process from ideas to interests to actions. It's not all that simple. And what he actually wanted to say is this, the modern man, Weber, is in general unable to give religious ideas a significance for culture and national character, which they deserve. But it is, of course, not my aim to substitute for a one-sided materialistic and equally one-sided spiritualistic causal interpretation of culture and history. Both are equally possible. That is to say, Parsons' interpretation of Weber is, so to speak, uh, Counteracting Marx's argument is just, is just uh, without any basis. They are both possible and they interact. The third aspect I want to point out is fa the famous saying of Spinoza's determinatio est negatio. And now again back to Marx. Marx pointed out that the driving motive of the capitalist is personified capitalist. Uh, sorry, as personified capital, that is his expression, is not use value and employment, but exchange value and uh, actually should be consumption here, utilization. The effect of the social mechanism in which he, the capitalist, only a driving wheel, 
is that his own private consumption is regarded by him as a robbery of the accumulation of capital. That is Marx, you see. This anticipates Weber. Its <laughs> accumulation is a robbery of consumption, but consumption is a robbery of accumulation. And he went on. And this now relates to, so to speak, some phase, an early phase, where the spirit of capitalism was working uh, in its entirety and without uh, contamination, and a later phase where things became more blurred. But the original sin works everywhere. With the development of the capitalist mode of production, accumulation, and wealth, the capitalist ceases to be the mere incarnation of capital. Yeah? He feels a human stirring for his own Adam and is thus educated to smile at the rapture for asceticism as the prejudice, prejudice of the old fashioned treasurer, the miser actually. Whereas the classical capitalist brands individual consumption as a sin against his function and abstention from accumulation, the modernized capitalist is able to conceive of accumulation as the renunciation of his pleasure drive. So you see, now there is the Faustian conflict. Later on, capitalists have to <laughs> solve a problem. How much to consume, how much to accumulate? Does that depend on the competitive conditions, um, on, on, the, on the scenery, so to speak, upon which they work? And then Marx adds, um, the vulgar economist has never made the simple reflection that every human action can be conceived as abstention from its opposite. Eating is abstinence from fasting, walking abstinence from standing, working abstinence from lazing, lazing abstinence from working, etc. The gentleman would do well to reflect for once on Spinoza's determinatio est negatio. Now, if we apply that to our argument with regard to Weber, the reward that he is ascetic capitalist expects for his abstinence from consumption is the grace of God and nothing but the grace of God. Could there be something more valuable to him than this? Clearly not. So the abstinence theory of profits, according to Marx, but implicitly also according to Weber, is just a, a misunderstanding of historical and intellectual facts. Finally, quo vadis. Both Marx and Weber were impressed by the creative come destructive power of capitalism. Marx, an optimist, however, to some extent, expected the rise of socialism to, so to speak, solve all the problems um, that were uh, giving mankind difficulties. Weber, Weber, on the other hand, was culturally a pessimist and even defeatist. He feared that the future might exhibit apocalyptic features. Mankind was locked in an iron cage, we have heard. And perhaps, he wrote, until the last ton of fossilized coal is burnt. That is <laughs> clearly enough uh, apoc apocalyptic, and I think it, run, it, it rings a bell today. I mean, uh, the scarcity of uh, natural resources but also culturally for the last stage of this cultural development, it might well be truly said, specialists without spirit, analysts without art. And he went on, this nullity imagines that it has attained a level of civilization never before achieved. Progress, yes, but which kind of progress and where are we now? So you see, Weber was not, so to speak, uh, um, applauding what, what happened in the world. Now, what about Marx? And I clue, conclude with this. Marx placed all his hope in socialism's capacity to reconcile mankind with itself, but also with nature. He said so in some places. However, he did not only fear the exhaustibility of natural resources, such as coal and mineral deposits, he also asked, and this is one year after Capital Volume 1 was published in 1867, what will happen if the utilization of land, which is a potentially renewable resource, is not consciously controlled and leaves behind deserts, destroys the bed? Will socialism still have a chance then? 
He was not so clear. And in his geological notebooks, interestingly enough, he asked whether humanity and Earth will permanently get along with each other or whether Earth will eventually rid itself of humanity. Long before, so to speak, our, our discussion and Stephen Hawking and whatnot. Well, sorry to have, uh, <laughs> so have plagued you for such a long time. Thank you very much for your patience and attention. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Heinz, for such a rich uh, presentation. I think you, you gave us a lot of output. I don't know how we are going to digest so many ideas, so many uh, topics and problems and ways of looking, not only on, at economics, but also our uh, social sciences. So I think uh, since we are having, I mean, we are running out of time, perhaps it's uh, better to, to, to open the, 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 the session for, for questions and comments uh, from participants. So who wants to, to start uh, the, the discussion? Mohan Rao. Yep, yep, Benjamin, and then Tony, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, yeah, Benjamin. Your mic is closed. It's, 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 yeah, you, might, you have to open you. Yes, uh, starting to, to thanks, uh, um, Professor Kurtz, uh, for uh, so sa sagacious, you know, uh, uh, a talk about uh, so wonderful, impressive thinker uh, was uh, Max Weber. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kors, on behalf of uh, the development economics field, uh, uh, which uh, joined EFOR with uh, uh, Investigación Económica to, to to make this effort on behalf on, on honoring Professor Thirwell. I like, uh, I'll try to put forward uh, a twofold uh, question. Uh, I expect uh, to be uh, clear enough. Uh, considering um, Weber developed uh, his social criticism of the capitalism in the first decade of the last century. And uh, uh, considering at the same time, time that Weber, uh, for him, uh, uh, the, the organizations are meant to improve people's life. And that means that organization, uh, enterprises, uh, uh, to, to say so, deal with people. People must be the concern of uh, uh, capitalism and a specific uh, concern uh, of the uh, firms, the enterprises in one society, in one economy. Uh, Weber said, no matter so much data and figures, people is first. Uh, well, um, considering uh, uh, the, the, the current times, uh, which uh, witness the rise of big corporation, uh, Amazon, for instance, uh, to be updated because uh, uh, the pandemics uh, seems to be functional, you know, for, for the rising of this kind of uh, enterprises. Uh, we like to pick up uh, your opinion. Uh, how well, how good uh, hold the expectation of Max Weber uh, before these uh, dramatic uh, times? Uh, the second and last question, 
uh, is related to other kind of expectation. The expectation of our region, Latin America, to uh, find a way uh, to meet growth and development. Because uh, uh, precisely in the book uh, you were quoting, the Protestant ethic, Max Weber uh, claimed that uh, there was a reason why capitalism doesn't evolve in Italy and or Spain. He, be, he, be, he gave some different reasons, ras, uh, uh, acceptable reason by this time why these two countries are uh, uh, less behind uh, with respect to capitalism, which was born in Europe. Um, and, and, and he, he was uh, quite uh, acute, no? that the problem was the Catholic region. Uh, Weber uh, uh, quote, but uh, 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 other economic conditions which are determin determining you know, growth in these two countries, but, see, but uh, he is uh, quite insistent about saying religion's condition in these two countries. Uh, so uh, we, we look around and uh, we have uh, saw in the last and the, um, act, uh, this uh, century, the rise of China, India, Russia, uh, well, uh, South Africa also, and, and Brazil, uh, different countries with uh, plenty of people, of population, but uh, they were trying, and still, I think, because uh, the infrastructure they construct in the first decade of this century, they are fighting, you know, uh, to, to get uh, a, a more mature uh, capitalism in their countries. But uh, thinking on the average, uh, this kind of uh, reasoning, uh, a hypothesis uh, said by Mr. Max Weber at the beginning of the last century, I repeat again, uh, what the future for Latin America, for countries like Mexico, ¿verdad? which uh, obviously is uh, our homeland. So uh, I, I think uh, the, the audience in general and myself, we are very uh, pleased if uh, you have uh, some comments about these two twofold questions. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, Heinz, let me ask you, uh, would, would you like to, to uh, reply now or would you like, uh, or, or if it's okay if we just collect uh, some more, more questions? I think um, it, would be, it would be uh, good if you collect it because time is scarce. Right. And um, I can then try to give a summary answer if possible, if, if you agree, Professor. I, I, yeah. I, I do, I do. So okay. please, Tony, Tony, can you please uh, uh, raise your, your question? Yes, well, first of all, I'd like to thank Heinz very much for his uh, talk. I learned a lot, not least because I have to confess, in my 80 years, I've never read anything by Max Weber. So you taught me uh, a lot. But <laughs> <laughs> I did read when I was young, uh, Richard Tawney's uh, Re Religion and the Rise of Capitalism. Yes. But I can't remember how much of an input there was from Weber into that uh, book, which I, as a young man, I found very uh, convincing as an explanation of uh, why the Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. started in, in, in England. So that's my first question. My second question is, um, has anybody ever written uh, an essay on the counterfactual? On the? Uh, what would have happened? The counterfactual. Oh, about what would have happened in England and, and Europe 
if there hadn't been uh, a Protestant uh, uh, Reformation. I think uh, Benjamin has alluded to this in Spain. My third question is about uh, Schumpeter, because you did in passing mention Schumpeter. And it occurs to me that, well, Schumpeter was younger uh, than Weber, but he was already attacking the German historical school in the um, early 1900s. And as you know, he, he was very unhappy with the state of economics and particularly the, the static analysis of the Marshallist Revolution and uh, the Bible of uh, Marshall, uh, where the issue of uh, growth and what drives growth is, um, is put to one side. And I just wondered whether there was any uh, correspondence between uh, Weber and Schumpeter, who already around about that time at a very young age had started on his uh, book, The Theory of the Economic Development, which I think was published when he was uh, 26 or, or 27, if I'm, I'm not mistaken, which is an attempt to make the economic theory and, and, and understanding of the economics much more growth oriented than it was ever in, uh, in Marshall. And my fourth question is about, um, it surprised me a lot that you said that Weber never really says anything about uh, technical progress and growth. But I mean, the whole essence of the Industrial Revolution, <laughs> technical progress, uh, you know, the steam engine, the factory system, the revolution in, in transport, everything <laughs> is changing in this uh, critical period of 50, 60 years in the in the um, early middle of the, of the 19th century. That surprises me a lot. So th those are my four questions, observations. Thanks very much. Hmm? Okay, thank you, Sunny, for your questions. Perhaps we can uh, collect one more question. Yes, Mohan, go ahead. Thank you, Ignacio. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kutz, uh, for giving us uh, a wonderful, uh, uh, not just talk on Weber, but also an interpretation. Uh, as I see it, uh, uh, underlying your talk is an interpretation of Weber and his ideas, if you like, from an economist point of view. Uh, and I would add, not from any old economist point of view, but I should say from the point of view of somebody who appreciates the work of heterodoxy in economics, particularly Karl Marx, which was evident in your talk, uh, but also von Neumann and Srafa, who are also uh, present uh, in your interpretations. Uh, I, I'd like to raise one question uh, in regard to what you've said, uh, but also make a this sort of uh, uh, comment after that. In terms of the question, as I see it, uh, you pinpoint three key points uh, underlying Weber uh, that are relevant from the point of view of understanding growth and development. One is absolute value, the production of absolute surplus value. The second is the motive for accumulation. And the third is population growth, which has to step in. So if you like, in terms of the big variables in growth models, it's uh, K and L and the rate of profit. Those are the three uh, foci of concern in your talk. Uh, and you spell out what you uh, believe Weber had to say on each of these counts and we have heard you. But on the side of Marx, uh, as I said, I see her talk as a talk, not just on Weber, but Weber and Marx uh, side by side. Uh, on the side of Marx, you get a very different interpretation of these three central issues of modern economic growth. Uh, on the production of surplus value, I think uh, Marx would have said that the subsistence crises of the feudal epoch uh, and the crises brought on by the enclosure movement in early modern capitalist Europe uh, caused 
uh, an increase, if you like, in the rate of exploitation of workers over and beyond what feudalism could have enforced. Uh, so that's an exploitative theory of absolute surplus value. Uh, secondly, on the motive for accumulation, you may recall Marx's uh, quotation, accumulate, accumulate, that's Moses and the prophets. And so there is a prophetic element in Marx, just as much as in Weber. In Weber, the prophetic element comes directly from religion, uh, from Protestant, Protestantism. But in Marx, I am willing to suggest a bet that what Marx had in mind was really the compulsions of the market. Accumulation, you see, we, we think it, it, that, that the capitalist, that the capitalist forces the worker to work hard. That's true. But we also need to recognize that the capitalist himself is forced to accumulate because if he does not accumulate, he'll fall by the wayside on the road to competition and competitive survival. So it's really a Marx-Darwin model that Marx has for accumulation. And finally, on population growth, I think we, we know from modern studies, including the studies by Kuznets, that the population explosion that the world has seen since 1860, you know, first in the first world, then later in the second world, and finally now in the third world, the population explosion can be very well explained by simple, you know, ordinary economic uh, uh, causality. Uh, thus, for example, improving conditions of life reduce rates of mortality. And subsequently, they reduce rates of fertility because people are able to secure old age savings and uh, savings for the rainy day and so on um, without having to rely on children, uh, which is what explains why poor countries have population, uh, high rates of fertility and so on. So I think Marx, in my view, and I'd like to hear your view about this, has a more cogent uh, set of arguments or the three key uh, points about modern capitalist economic growth. Uh, and, and I'd like to con conclude with, uh, with a comment. Uh, uh, I mean, this, this is a somewhat tongue in cheek. Uh, when growth happens in Protestant countries, well, of course, that is because of the Protestant ethic. When it happens in Catholic countries or in non-Protestant countries, that is usually explained as a miracle. You know, that, that may be a miracle from God. So we hear about the Japanese miracle, we he hear about the Italian growth miracle, the Brazilian growth miracle, the Mexican growth miracle. And indeed we hear about the East Asian growth miracle and the East Asian miracle economies report of the World Bank is a very notorious or famous depending on your point of view, report on the subject. Uh, so it seems to me certainly Weber is with us all the time, you know, uh, as much as Marx at least. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, but it, it seems to me that the the the, the Weber is is with us precisely because we continue to interpret uh, the world. I'm, I'm when I say we, I mean you know a lot of a lot of social scientists, not necessarily Marxists and uh, economists, uh, particularly from the point of view of the of the of this uh, of this ideological lens that we wear in regard to saving and. Uh, 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 other variables of the economy. Thank you. Thank you, Mohan. So, Heinz, now can you give us uh, your response and perhaps we can have a second round of questions? Okay, go ahead. Um, you know, I mean, uh, I, I'm an emeritus professor, but my inclination to talk is still infinite. So, uh, <laughs> um, how many minutes do you give me? <laughs> uh, I try to be as brief as possible, but this means, of course, that the most interesting comments I just got will only be answered partially, if at all. So please forgive me, but it is the chairman who is responsible for uh, my incapacity to fully satisfy you in terms of my answers. <laughs> well, um, let me let me uh, start from uh, Benjamin Pais. Um, I mean, Weber, I think, I mean, he was not, so to speak, like Marx, a, a critic of capitalism and uh, a follower of some other not yet uh, clear social alternative. 
uh, he looked at things as they were, but he was convinced, and this I think is a, an important aspect, that mankind, given our very limited possibilities to understand what is going on, will always be more or less subject to demons. And there will always be, I mean, kind of uh, foolish ideas that will uh, conquer us, our thinking, not, all, not of all people, but maybe of, of, of sufficient uh, majorities. And uh, recent uh, developments uh, in the United States, as I mentioned, Brazil, India, perhaps is a, ca a case is in point. So, uh, I mean, even though he talks about rationalization and intellectualization, which sounds as if this was a, an avenue, so to speak, towards uh, uh, truth, beauty, and so on and so forth, he was not convinced that this is the case. Mankind is uh, always coping with huge problems and the question is whether in particular situations under consideration you can cope with them in such a way that at least many of, of us will live a decent life or not. So I think that is what I, what I learned from his, he's a cultural pessimist despite all the progress he talks about, all uh, the things that are happening, uh, he does not think that we will eventually end up in in paradise, so to speak, paradise on earth. That was not his view. Um, now, secondly, um, as regards organizational change, there Weber was always very much interested in finding out which kind of formal and informal devices were applied in order to exert power and dominate people. I mean, when he studied, for example, the schooling and the university system, one of his main concerns was, I mean, what does grading mean and how? Was it, so to speak, a process of domination or were there means and forms by means of which, so to speak, uh, the control of people's minds and their behavior was not at the forefront of the entire thing, the thing but it was about learning. So this is what is, is very important. And this also relates to an aspect which was mentioned um, uh, by Professor Thurbol, namely, you're right, I mean, uh, technical progress, uh, as, as we economists would talk about it, played hardly any role. Uh, I was perhaps not clear enough, it played a role in the sense of changing uh, the organizational system, the production system, factory system, um, wage, uh, uh, wage systems, I mean, uh, retail systems, etc., etc. He was very much into that. And again, as so to speak, uh, conveyors of uh, possibilities to exert power, to control, uh, to benefit uh, by some uh, over the others. Uh, I mean, power Weber defined as uh, the capability of some people to make other people do what they wouldn't do if they were not under the spell of the power. And clearly enough, if you go to a factory, even if you're a free person, free to be, to be able to go there, <laughs> once you're in there, you're under the spell and there's a clear hierarchy, there's the boss. And I mean, the famous uh, paper by uh, Stephen Marklin, what do bosses do, of course, tells you a story. I mean, even if power is not, so to speak, graspable, it is there everywhere. It, it is also in our minds. I mean, so to speak, uh, what, what we believe we can do under certain circumstances and what not is of course shaped very much by the institutional structure. So power is a, is a, is a phenomenon which uh, according to Weber is, is everywhere. And of course it changes as time goes by. Now there was one remark by um, Professor Pais about Amazon, what we are currently um, experiencing is indeed a dramatic change in the, in the power situation in the world. Uh, in, the, in a twofold sense, I would say we have now uh, uh, a segmentation. We always had segmentations of the labor market and amongst firms, but now we have a segmentation very much in the, in the sector 
of uh, enterprises between a monopolistic sector, which is essentially data capitalism and all that. I mean, monopolies uh, working on uh, artificial intelligence that is learning machinery uh, and uh, uh, dynamically increasing returns to scale where you cannot, uh, so to speak, uh, cope uh, and compete with, uh, with Amazon and others because once they have an advantage, because of dynamically increasing the terms of scale, it's very difficult to to um, to get them. And uh, so the, the the sector of firms will, will get more di dispersed in terms of some having and exerting monopoly power as opposed to the others. And the competitive segment will, I think, uh, not benefit from what was going on. The pandemic, of course, showed this to an enormous extent. They will have lower rates of profit, but we'll have difficulties to survive, and we are really in, in danger of, um, I mean, yes, uh, what was that famous book, 1984, uh, where a few comp companies uh, who also have, of course, surveillance and, uh, and other opportunities to, to control people will, will dominate the system. So there's a big problem, and you have of course, as a reflection of that, also in the labor market, a segmentation between skilled laborers who know to go about these new technologies and basically the rest of the world. And since, um, since artificial intelligence is uh, becoming applicable also to jobs which are not just simple and uh, unskilled, but uh, more and more skilled, uh, you will have uh, also the problem. What Ricardo already pointed out in 1821, Namely, if you have a system of full automation, how can workers who are not capitalists survive? What can they live on, et cetera, et cetera. So there are, there are huge problems involved. So uh, this is uh, this. Now, uh, as regards, as regards uh, Latin America, I think Weber would have had not much to say. He had a lot to say about uh, the, uh, about the, about capitalism in Italy. And he also knew quite a bit about uh, the fact that in, in some parts, Catholics played an important role because if you're in a minority position and they became into a minority position in some Protestant areas, then they had to be particularly entrepreneurial in order to be able to survive. So, I mean, you had, you had so to speak, a, a pull and push uh, effects, uh, which played an important role and clearly enough, I mean, at the beginning of uh, of, of, of certain uh, capitalist uh, aspects um, were, were discussed uh, and, and the role of uh, Catholicism was discussed in a book by Fanfani, uh, who was a politician also, but uh, Fanfani was a, a, an economist, economic historian uh, who wrote about this. Now, um, as regards um, Tony Thurwell, yes, Tony, Tony benef benefited, I think, quite a bit from uh, um, Weber, but he added to it. And uh, I think what he did partly was to give it, uh, to give Weber's picture uh, less uh, awful uh, features. <laughs> I mean, he pointed out, and I think for good reasons, that very often Protestants were not only, so to speak, I mean, these steel hard characters who tried to make profits as much as possible and didn't care about the rest of the world. No, they were inclusive, at least within their own environment, much more than in, in certain other parts. And they took religion seriously because they didn't have the opportunity as the, the Catholics to go uh, to the priest and say, look, I did this and that, and it's all terrible, but now forgive me. And I will again have an open door uh, to heaven. Uh, so, that played a role. Now, counterfactuals. Uh, that is, of course, always an interesting thing. We ought to think about what would have been the case if this or that did not happen. But at the same time, and I think Weber would answer that way, there are too many counterfactuals around. You can create all kinds of stories if what happened didn't happen, but something else happened. And clearly enough, even what happened, if you projected into the future is essentially a counterfactual experiment because you're saying, well, I mean, if there is now technological change, this affects employment, maybe now it goes down, but maybe in the future it goes up. And so you have to 
essentially speculate and you have to play around with maybe a scenario te technique and so on and so forth. But I think it's not, it's not easy to answer. Uh, it's, it's not easy to answer and therefore I think Weber would not have had a clear cut answer to that. Schumpeter, now Schumpeter indeed, uh, I mean Weber brought him in into this project about uh, the outline of social economics because he invited him, Schumpeter, he was uh, I think barely 30 years of age to write the essay on the history of economic thought and methodology which is a tremendous, of course, uh, a thing for such a young man. And Schumpeter indeed wrote his uh, epochs of the history of thought and methodology, which was the nucleus of his later book, The History of Economic Analysis. So he, he did so. Um, yes, Schumpeter, Schumpeter, of course, was of the opinion that existent theory at the time, Walrasian theory, which he he thought very highly of in some other uh, respects, was basically not interesting. It was not interesting because it, it did not really discuss what was the crucial feature of modernity, as so to speak, the new normal, and that is invention. If you do not talk about invention and its effects, you are lost. And this was also the main argument Schumpeter's against Keynes. Keynes' general theory spoke about a little bit about innovations and all that, but that was a major failure that Keynes would not enter into a details, detailed discussion of it. Now, clearly enough, Schumpeter understood that Weber's work on the Protestant ethic was concerned with the absolute value creation, not the relative value creation. Therefore, so to speak, um, technical progress what was out, out of the perspective, so to speak. Uh, but he was, um, I think, learning from Weber quite a bit and not always, uh, uh, I mean, informing people about that. I, I would not say this is plagiarism, not at all, not at all, because in those days, the citation rules were very different from what they are today. I mean, the major authors were understood to have been read by all people involved in the discussion. And therefore, you did not have to, uh, to uh, give a, a document. Uh, every time you made use of an argument by Marx, by uh, Schumpeter, by blah, blah, blah. Uh, but he benefited quite a bit, quite a bit from him. Now, um, um, yes, um, it, is, it is true to, to Rao, Professor Rao, that uh, in, in, in my paper, heterodoxy, if you wish, played a role. I mean, well, I mean, for Neumann, I don't know. But uh, I think good theory played a role. I <laughs> tried to use good theory to illustrate arguments by, by Weber, and it just so happens that he essentially had in mind a system in which you produce only basic commodities, no non-basics, no luxuries, and in which you have indeed the production of commodities by means of commodities. And this is a von Neumann model, and if you then also see that I mean, the, the machines, uh, the investing machine versus the, uh, the, what was it, Weber had a similar expression. Uh, that, 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 is, that is really nice. Now, Marx, yes, I agree. In, in various respects, of course, Marx went far beyond Weber. Marx tried to cope also with the, with the phase in which capitalism um, had seen now the Industrial Revolution and developed uh, in, in, in the new uh, normal, so to speak. He was discussing about um, uh, different forms of technical progress, industry and machinery and whatnot. And he was also keen to um, put, so to speak, what, what later on Schumpeter did in terms of his long waves of, of, of development. He tried to uh, put things into, a, into an order in, in which different forms of technical progress played a, a, a crucial role. Now, so um, I, do not, I do not dispute this, not at all. And as regards population growth, uh, uh, et cetera, your, your, all your elements are, are well taken. Let me just point out that accumulate, accumulate, that is Moses and the prophets. Moses, this comes from from uh, remarks by Marx, in which he deals indeed 
the, so to speak, the religious impact of the thing, where he anticipates basically personified capital, accumulate, accumulate, that is Moses and the prophets. So to speak, it is a godly wish that I accumulate. And uh, so to speak, the Faustian conflict between consumption and accumulation comes later in my paper. I, of course, refer to that. You will, you will see that if you uh, take the time to, to read it. Uh, and uh, clearly enough, um, uh, Marx uh, was very well aware of that tight relationship between rel religiosity and economics. And actually, this is interesting, perhaps, I don't know whether you knew this. Marx came to political economy via Engels. Engels published a paper in 1844 uh, entitled, in German, of course, Outline of a Criticism of Political Economy. In this, he called Luther, Martin Luther, uh, the Adam Smith of economics. What was the reason? The reason was, he argued, that uh, earlier uh, phases of development, the mercant mercantilist period, was characterized by brutality and uh, uh, deceit and, and, and so on, very bad. And Smith came in, free trade, and came in and tried to put, so to speak, a, a, a nice uh, cloak around free trade, make it uh, uh, look better. He was, so to speak, the Martin Luther in economics. And uh, Marx uh, clearly, I mean, took up um, several of the ideas of, of, uh, of Engels. Um, well, yes, I, I didn't answer all your questions, I'm sorry, but uh, that is what I, what I could uh, say in, 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 in direct reaction. Thank you, Hans, for your reply. So I, I think we have uh, just, you know, I mean, time for one question, one quick question from the audience, if someone is willing to raise it. Otherwise... I think uh, Penelope... Yes, Penelope, would you, would you like to... Are you thinking of anything to... No? Okay. So perhaps I would just, uh, you know, take this opportunity to make a, one quick comment. Uh, well, um, I, I begin with an anecdote. Uh, just to uh, uh, mention that, uh, 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 yes, you, you, you said that Max Weber's work was translated into English by Talcott Parsons. And perhaps that is the reason why in the United States, at least uh, among sociologists, there seems to be a sort of functionalist interpretation of Weber's work. Whereas in Latin America, Max Weber's work was translated by a sociologist and that was not a, a functionalist uh, approach to Weber. And perhaps that is one of the reasons why uh, socialists and socialists in Latin America have a sort of more accurate uh, Weberian approach to Weber's work. But on the opposite, I think that prevented, uh, prevented economists from looking at Weber's work <laughs> because yeah, Weber is understood as a sociologist. And it is very rare to meet an economist, Mexican or Latin American uh, for that matter, that is aware, not only that has read, but is aware of the economics of, of Max Weber. And the other thing that I would like to point out is that, uh, yes, you mentioned uh, this uh, very important uh, issue in Max Weber's uh, work with regards to the freedom of value judgment. But it came as a surprise to me that you didn't uh, touch upon uh, you know, Myrdal, and I know you are aware of Myrdal's work. Myrdal published a book originally in Swedish in 1929, and then it, it, this book was translated later, or well, much later into English. I presume it was translated in some, in somewhere in the 1950s. <laughs> which is the book uh, titled The Political Element in the Development of Economic Theory. And uh, Myrdal was very much against uh, uh, value judgments uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, he made us aware of the fact that when in particular, a marginalized economies, uh, neoclassical economies, 
talk about uh, 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 economic theory free of value judgment, you have to be careful. You have to be aware of the fact that most likely these economists are trying, are trying to pass value judgments as scientific uh, uh, arguments. And I think that is very important. And I, I wonder whether there, was some, whether there was some influence of Max Weber on, uh, on Mirdal, who was, of course, a citizen of a Protestant country. And finally, uh, I think uh, Max Weber was very much against uh, an hypothesis that had a, a, you know, a, a very wide currency in those times, the hypothesis of prior savings. From what you said- About of, of? Of prior savings, mm -hmm. prior savings. Yeah. From, what you, from what you said, it occurs to me that uh, Max Weber was also very much against uh, uh, says law. In, uh, says law, I mean, uh, supply creates its own demand. So, and I would like to, 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 to have your comments on that. Thanks very much, uh, Ignacio. Um, the first point you made about functionalist uh, interpretation and non-functionalist or socialist interpretation, uh, this is interesting. I didn't know uh, that uh, a translation in Latin America was so different from Parsons because Parsons uh, played indeed an important role uh, all over the world, interestingly enough. And I think that was not always um, to the... Sorry, to the best of, to the, to the best of Weber. Um, I, I would like to know more about it. Uh, and uh, perhaps you can uh, uh, give me an indication which, which book you have in mind. Oh, of course, I can find it by Googling. Now, Mirdal, the political, economy, uh, political element uh, in economics. Yes, that is, a, it is an important book. And I think Mirdal is, is quite right. Now, I think um, uh, I have not now uh, looked at Mirdal's book and uh, tried to find out whether he refers to Weber. But, uh, at the time, 1929, Weber's uh, reputation was already uh, quite substantial, and uh, he can be uh, thought of uh, being known uh, across the borders, not least because at that time, Jem was still a lingua franca. People, Myrdal in particular, but uh, Lindahl, uh, all the Wixel, all the Scandinavian authors, they read German as did the French and so on and so forth. In the, in the natural sciences, it was uh, indeed also uh, the language in which people published. Wixel, for example, published much of his stuff in German. So he can, can be assumed to, to, to know it. Now, as regards Weber, I think Weber, I try to, to indicate this, had a, had a peculiar position. I mean, he understood that uh, the object of inquiry, the economy, was very complex. And that, <laughs> I mean, people would uh, select perhaps particular aspects of it and come up with uh, interpretations, which perhaps would not fit together amongst themselves, but yet uh, portrayed some important elements. Uh, so he was very much in favor of uh, uh, pluralism. Uh, he did not think that uh, only one kind of economics should rule the roost. That would have been wrong, and he was particularly not in favor of, at the time, uh, marginal utility theory and, uh, and so on to rule the roost, because this was accused of, as, as you might remember, uh, of uh, uh, the, the fallacy. Um, uh, we talked about it. He was very critical. He thought these are producing utopias. And to believe that these utopias give you uh, the full truth, as some people claim, about the world is just ridiculous. Of course, some would say not the full truth. But what, what we find very often in economics nowadays is, well, look, I mean, I give you all the facts. And the facts imply this. And this is, again, a fallacy. The facts do not imply anything. You must have, so to speak, an argument, a key, a theory that tells you what the fa facts tell you. 
And if the theories you apply tell you different things, then it does not make sense that there is just one theory that is the best of all. And if you look at them in the, I mean, this has a lot to do, of course, with with uh, Friedman, Friedmanite's uh, methodology. Now you can make whatever assumptions you wish. Uh, what it, um, matters is, I mean, your predictive capacity. Now this is rubbish, I think. And Samuelson said that already, because what you also predict is the correctness of your of your assumptions. Now, if you assume an aggregate production function, <laughs> and so on and so forth, I mean, you, you, you can ridicule this. So, I mean, what I wanted to say, Weber was was very much uh, interested in hearing alternative views. He was against professors, so to speak, performing as politicians, rallying, so to speak, students behind their ideology. He was in favor of, I mean, doing good work and uh, exposing students uh, to theories uh, and discussing alternative theories. Critically, that was clearly possible, but uh, he, he felt that, and, and, and the people he criticized were the his historicists. And they really very often were, in, I mean, more ethically oriented than intellectually uh, uh, knowledgeable. Okay. Now, third, uh, third, I mean, uh, there's nothing about Say's law as far as I know. Uh, he did not get that deeply into the matter. Uh, and also because, you see, at the time, we are still in pre-Keynesian times. There were, of course, a few people who disputed the validity of Say's law. Um, even in the German speaking area, but uh, the majority of economists were still of the opinion that uh, whatever is being saved will be invested. And if you, if you think about the Weberian world in Puritan times, I mean, the capitalists, he gets the profits and he is the investor. So the saver is the investor. There was not the split between personalities, saving and investing, which creates a problem. Uh, therefore, I think uh, in, in, in his case, there is no, at least no interesting, as far as I can say, discussion of this problem. Thank you very much, Heinz. So we have exhausted our time. Uh, and thank you very much for such a very enlightening and important uh, discussion of Max Weber's uh, work. Let, let me just tell uh, uh, everybody that uh, this, I mean, this talk will be converted into a final version of a paper that Heinz is preparing for Investigación Economica. And this uh, paper is forthcoming, uh, in, I presume, in this year, because it's a part of the celebration of the 80th anniversary of Investigación Economica. And moreover, uh, there is also a book by Heinz Kuhs forthcoming through Fondo de Cultura Economica that must be published this year. I hope, I hope so. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, shortly, uh, there will be available a book by Heinz Kuhs in Spanish for uh, the uh, Latin American readership. So thank you very much again. Thank uh, Heinz for your presentation. Am I looking thank forward you. Thank to you. seeing you uh, 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 before long? And also thank, uh, I, I would like to thank uh, everybody for being with us in this seminar. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you again in the next, uh, 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 the next uh, seminar. Mohan, please, uh, you raise your hand. Sorry, no, I, I just uh, gave kudos. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Thank you very much. So thank you all and keep safe and, uh, and I'll see you next time. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you, Penny. Thank bye you. bye. Well, thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you all the people there okay. and uh, all the best. Okay, all the best for you as well.